Hey, everybody. This is Lauren Delisa Coleman back with you again on another episode of the Inside Series that we give you right here at film.io. And I'm very excited. This is our last interview, but certainly one of our most I, I think, um, you know, I never want to play favorites with the film, but this is a very important film that came out of the um, recent Asian American International Film Festival. Everybody knows AAIFF. Um, and I had to kind of hunt down this filmmaker a little bit. She's in Taiwan right now and staying up a little bit late to be able to join us. But I'm really so glad to welcome to the Inside Series, Yi Hui Li, who is the filmmaker behind a very cool film called um, the Black Kite, and we are going to get into um, really the filmmaking around that and all about her as we move into the episode right now. First of all, Iwe, thank you so much for joining us and again, staying up a little bit late in Taiwan you, right now to talk to us. Yeah, thank you, Lauren, for connecting us and hunting me down on Facebook. And um, yeah, hello, everyone. I'm the writer and the director of The Black Kite. My name is Li Yihui. You can call me Yihui or you can call me Li. The Black Kite is a story that happens during the time of Taiwanese white terror. And the protagonist is a seven-year-old girl. She has this wish to fly a kite again with her father. However, under the influence of the political trauma, the father was too ill to understand his daughter's goodwill. Thank you so much, Ihui. Um, Let's talk a little bit about, I guess, first of all, kind of how you came to filmmaking. You're a Columbia University alum. Yay. Um, <laughs> I, I went to the undergrad um, portion of the university. You, of course, went um, on to other parts of it. Um, maybe let's start by giving our viewers a little bit of um, insight about what it was like at Columbia and how that maybe gave you, um, I guess, the foundation really to be able to move ahead with the Black Kite. To join Columbia, to participate in the program helped me so much because um, as you know that um, Taiwanese film has its high peak during the Taiwanese um, um new era of film, new, um, new wave, Taiwanese new wave. And that kind of work um, situation is an author lead um, mode of working. And right now Taiwan is facing a uh, transformation for the industry to go um, more commercial and more with more diversity kinds of film. And um, the work, uh, kind of the work mode and the way to work with uh, the crew that I learned from Colombia actually helped me to establish a way of like new film makers, especially for female to um, lead a crew to shoot um, the story. So I would assume a lot of those experiences um, gave you, I don't know, a kind of different look at filmmaking or a different kind of route. While you were in Taiwan and still there today, um, what's the filmmaking community like and how has it been able to give you the support to be able to create Black Kite in the past as well as what you're working on now? Okay, uh, my father was sick and he has um, this, he, he has this, um, illness of schizophrenia and um, he inspired me into making the black kite. Okay. Even though um, it was an issue about white terror and my father was not uh, a direct victim of the white terror, but I feel I share a very deep connection with the victim's daughter because um, my father has this illusion of himself under the civilians of the KMT government since I was a little girl. And as I grew up, I realized that my father was too sensitive and he was so sensitive that he could capture and absorb the fear that rooted in people's mind, the fear of um, dictatorship dictatorship the word is, is yes, it yes. right okay no, yes that's absolutely right that's the right yeah. word yes 
Okay, yeah. Um, so the unspeakable fear was, I think was it, it was very deeply imprinted in people's memory. And the pain and suffering affects not only the victims, but also people around him or her. For most cases in political traumas, um, the pain can, can, can be transferred to their families, like the victim's wife and children. And um, as far as I know, their misfortune was um, often neglected in the narration of our history and our films and our arts. Therefore, I decided that I would shot the black kite from the point of view of a seven-year-old girl. How interesting, and, and thank you for sharing that with us because I know that's probably not easy, um, you know, for you with your, your father and that relationship. You, you pick such a, both a personally heavy and a, a culturally heavy topic as one of your first major films. Was that, I mean, are you just like a superwoman or was <laughs> this really just something that had been in your mind for so long that you just had to express it? Well, I majored in history during um, college, but still to be picked up such a heavy theme, I needed to do a lot of researches, um, including, I think it's necessary that I visited um, the victims of white terrors, and especially I uh, build up connections with their children, their wives and their daughter. And um, actually, <laughs> to be honest, like I felt so overwhelmed by their trauma and their oh. sorrow, their suffer. During that period, I even needed um, professional help to um, let me work normally. And um, oh, it was a very hard process, but I knew that I had to go through these phases. Um, I remember there was once, and I, I decided to visit the jails that um, once was um, built for political criminals. It's on an island near Taiwan called the Green Island. And I stayed there for like three days. And um, I found that interestingly, even though they were suffering through this pain, they tried to make fun and they tried to like um, create humorous little items or amusements for, for themselves and for people around them. So I find that it was a relief to me. And I thought if I could um, put some humorous elements into the black height, it would take the audience more um, comfortably into accepting this story. So as you can see in this um, second act, there was um, um, cute, uh, cute dramatic scenes about children, how children see this um, traumatic father in their understandings. Right. How interesting. Now, how long did it take you from the beginning of your research to like, say, the day that you wrapped? What was the total time in that? And also, how long did it take you to write the script? For me, I usually take a lot of time for preparation and let it um, like sink down in my mind. And then when I sit down to write, it's usually often um, within a month especially it's a short film, um, I wrote it quickly and didn't make lots of adjustment. Um, only there was a scene that I had struggled myself to try to keep it when I rewrite it. Um, I didn't know why, but I, I wanted that scene so much. And while directing it, I saw it with um, the actors, the father, it, it was a scene that somehow the father and daughter finally connected to each other. And um, while I saw, saw it with my eyes, I realized why I wanted to keep it so much. Because um, 
it's kind of something that I didn't have in my life. So um, yeah, making films for me is kind of um, a way to also release my pain. Wow, it's just it's just so amazing because as I was watching this, I had no idea how personally you were connected to that. And, you know, nothing from the notes really um, gives that sense. So I'm just so, I feel like, you know, so honored to be able to speak with you about that. And again, thank you for sharing it because it's never easy. Um, I think that that was probably challenging enough uh, for you as a filmmaker to, uh, I guess, kind of be able to balance the emotional uh, kind of struggles around that. Um, so maybe that, you know, is nothing compared to, or rather, you know, maybe some of the logistical challenges around the film is nothing compared to that. But did you have any other kind of, you know, maybe more mechanical um, challenges, the challenges in actually, you know, producing, creating the film, bringing it to life that you, you know, kind of overcame as you were creating this? Yeah, of course. Um, actually, to rebuild a 1960s family is a hard work with limited budget, and uh, we find it um, it was it was like so hard because Taiwan developed um, so fast that um, I would say that um, many historical um, architectures and views were destroyed. Um, so it was a difficult job for us to find all over Taiwan just to find one house that still doesn't have electricity and doesn't have water and still have the wood um, wood window, wood kind, um, yeah. Um, but we did it. It took us like for three months. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and um, we partly rebuilt it. And during the shoot, we couldn't move the, uh, we, we have to shoot it still because if you move the camera, then there's another modern architecture there. And it's a new road that doesn't exist in 1960s. So yeah, that was quite difficult. And also directing children was a bit um, challenging for me because I love children and I don't want to see them suffer, especially my actor was a very, very cute girl. And she was so naive when we rehearsal, um, she was reacting so honestly to the mother who scolded her. And I found that if she, her performance was always giving her the truth, the true emotion, then, we can only shoot it once because we wanted to capture the shit from her join us to her um, sadness. So um, if we took a wrong take, then it needs like another day for her to recover from the emotional impact. So we um, kind of um, rehearse with the cameraman and um, yeah, the DP and all the crew, and we secretly shoot it. We told the actor that it was a rehearsal and we just started. And I guess she immediately knew that it's happening because she say all the lines in the language of Taiwanese, which is a language that she is not familiar with so clearly, and it's correct. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. It's just so, I mean, I don't think I could maybe come up with more challenges <laughs> for a film um, for, you know, an early director than this one. I mean, I can only imagine what you're going to do in your career later, because this had a multitude of issues, um, you know, let alone this the kind of sensitive storyline um, as well, right? The sens sensitive subject matter um, there you know, still today in, in Taiwan. So you have to be uh, very aware of that as well as everything else. So this is just really, 
really amazing and amazing feat. Congratulations to you. And I'm Thank sure you, you were happy. You're welcome. And I'm sure you were happy when this was accepted into AAIFF, no? Yes. And I'm very glad that they have a session of uh, Taiwan, Taiwan Project yeah. that shows uh, a very different kind of aspect and very uh, and the diversity of Taiwanese um, living situation. Yes, right, right. So given all this, you are almost um, the queen of getting over hurdles. What kind of tips might you have for filmmakers who are watching now who are either, I don't know, dealing with everything from uh, em emotional subject matter that is very personal in terms of being able to distance oneself from that or dealing you know, with, with children on set and more? I mean, what's maybe your, your biggest takeaway from this in terms of a tip, something that you learn that you would like to share? whatever, something along those lines? Mm, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I guess I would say that I find, I find it a very useful tip to be, because, um, you know, like usually we, um, see director as a leader. So um, the leader gives order and um, the director must know what she wants or what he wants and he, he or she might, must be very, very uh, confirm about that. But actually you can, you can wait, you can be patient and you can listen to crew and people who work around you to give them this respect and friendly environment for them to create their, to bring out their talent. And I, I find it, I find it pretty um, useful. <laughs> yeah, I find it, um, it's, it not only help us build a more friendly environment for female and children and um, many like uh, different uh, workers, in film industry, but also it helps create a better film. That's just so great. Um, I really love when filmmakers are able to kind of um, demystify ideas even that they had of themselves as filmmakers based on, you know, just kind of perception. So I think that that idea of not always having to have all the answers and putting that pressure on yourself to be um, to have a leadership style that might not be your own is a really great, great piece of advice to, to listen you. to others and to let others take the lead when it, when it's, um, right. Right. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to add? I know that you're working on a film, you know, another one right now. Um, you said that you'd been shooting all day. So can you give us any sneak like tips or behind the scenes on, um, sneak peek, I should say, or behind the scenes on what that is <laughs> yeah, going yeah, into? Yeah, of course. I would love to promote my films. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm actually working on several films. The, the one that I was shooting today was a short film called It's Perfectly Okay to Lie. It's about, um, <laughs> it's about the story of my own family. After shooting um, The Black Kite, I find the courage to um, embrace my past and to um, embrace what was born with me. So I decided to shoot the story of my family in a short film. And also I'm working on two feature films. One of them is called uh, Lives of Crime, which just got selected to the APM, the Asian Project Market of Bunshan International Festival um, in Korea. Uh, and it's, um, like I said, um, female workers in Taiwan have this awareness of that if we work together, if we look after each other, we grow stronger and faster. Yeah. So um, we, we try to shoot uh, anthology feature film by four um, 
female directors, each directing a short story that connected with each other. That's very cool. And also I'm working on a series. It's about um, the LGBTQ Taipei story. Uh, as you know that um, Taiwan is the first country that legitified um, gay, gay sex marriage. Yeah, so um, we wanted to show the world how friendly and <laughs> how difficult it was through this path. Wow. When do you sleep, Igwe? You don't want really <laughs> to sleep there. Because I know, because I've gotten emails from you at like 1.30 my time, and I'm like, okay, it's 12 hours difference. I know what time it is there. Go <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard question to answer <laughs> but yeah, I love I my work imagine. and I love making films that's great that's a beautiful point to end on I want to just thank you so much for taking the time for something that's um really so emotionally charged um both personally and culturally I, I really respect that and I just want to thank you again thank you so much Lauren You're welcome and you guys, thank you so much for watching. You know, we are bringing you so many different interviews with a variety of filmmakers around the world right here on film.io, the Inside Series. This has been Lauren DeLisa Coleman.